How many people have heard of NDN? Oh, wow, a few of you. Okay, great, excellent. Do you know what it is? Anybody actually know what it is? Okay, you've heard of it. You've heard of it. How many has heard of ICN, information-centric networking? Information-centric networking is a larger bubble in which many different projects are emerging that are all experimenting with this idea of rethinking networking, how to look at networking, but in particular the underlying protocols for moving data around uh, from an information point of view that is chunks of content rather than um, setting up point-to-point -point connections like we think of IP. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of this project or really some also some thoughts about this project. Uh, it's been going on, this particular version of ICN, it's called Name Data Networking, it's been going on for seven years, which is kind of a long time uh, by, by research funding standards, but maybe not a long time by, by internet, or communication uh, architecture standards anyway. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the evolution of, of ICN, and I'll use NDN as the, the example that I'll drill down into some tech details because that's the project that I'm involved with, and that's a project where there's a lot of code available that you can go play with yourself if you're brave. But I'll motivate it, uh, because some people, probably not people in this room who are actually are in the trenches, don't really understand why we need a new internet architecture, because doesn't the internet work great? Uh, I'm very happy to have an audience where I think it's resonant. These people understand more than better why we need a new internet architecture, because managing and securing it is impossible. Um, and then I'll, I'll spend most of the talk uh, describing the project, uh, and how it not only is the, the underlying philosophy of the project is building on what we've learned about the internet for the last 30 years, but also that we're learning about architecture as we do this research because it's really a, as basic a research project as network architecture can be. So we can do the obligatory, there's tons of data, everything's being digitized, books and movies and culture and content and knowledge and money and everything and exponentials no matter what kind of data you're talking about are abound. So we have tons of data and although the IP architecture, the TCP IP architecture that we all know and love was certainly built to move data around, in fact, it was built to move data around. One big use of it was to move data around from one supercomputer to another so that the government didn't have to pay for supercomputers everywhere. Uh, but now it's moving all kinds of data. Uh, and an important, in, in fact, maybe the fundamentally important idea about NDN is that for the last 100 years, the notion of communications, and the internet didn't change this. So people think the internet is a revolutionary model of communications relative to the telephone network, and there, and there is definitely revolutionary aspects to the IP architecture, packet switching being the ultimate uh, epi epitome of it. But the fundamental notion of setting up a point-to-point -point link and establishing a channel between it is really what the telephone network did. And that was great, but the internet didn't change that fundamental abstraction of communication. It's setting up to a link between two IP addresses. And that's important because although it's worked great for the IP, uh, IP was designed to do a certain thing, which is set up a channel of communication between two supercomputers and other things, and move, move data across, much like the phone network was set up to do its job. What we have seen in the last 30 years is the, the most common use of the internet, measured by bytes and packets and probably connections, but this can be argued, has been a different type of use of moving data around. It has been getting data from the network not necessarily going to a specific point to get it. In fact, most of us not only don't know where a specific piece of data comes from that we get, although we'd like it to have integrity, we'd like it to be the data that we, that we thought we were gonna get, but we don't care where we get it. We wanna get it somewhere where it del is get del delivered to it's fast and where it's cheap. So NDN, Name Data Networking, is, a, is an architecture idea that is built on this notion of look at how we're using the network today, and one can make some predictions that these aren't uh, fads, the way that we're using the network today. Obviously, things evolve, but uh, many of the ways that we use the network today are no longer well aligned to a communication architecture abstraction that is based on point-to-point -point channels of communication. That's the fundamental idea. If you're with me on that, and you can sort of suspend your disbelief about rebuilding the internet, uh, then I think you'll get something out of this talk. If you don't buy that, if you think, no, there's too many problems with this, model of the cloud anyway, and again, NDN is trying to address the problems of, many of the problems that um, have evolved by using the cloud over IP, right? And indeed, one could argue that we have the cloud because of IP, because the IP doesn't, because IP doesn't naturally support a communication abstraction that is about getting data, that is about content centric, that is, I have an interest in a piece of data and I just want that data to come to me and I don't care if it comes from his shoe which next year we'll have internet connectivity, whatever architecture it's called. So again, I don't think I need to convince you, this audience, but generally you need to convince an audience. Why do we need to rethink the fundamental architecture of the internet? Is it broken? 
Obviously, it's been hugely successful. The core protocols now are decades old, and more importantly, they weren't designed to be the global internet. So nobody's ever designed an internet. Let's be clear, right? The DARPA net, we're still using the basic protocols that were funded by DARPA to build a, an, an internet, but not the global internet where our banking and our medical records in some countries have voting on it right now. So uh, we, uh, if you've spent enough time studying the internet, which I have, and if you've spent enough time trying to manage and secure the internet, which many of you have, or parts of the internet, I think that you can at least be amenable to the idea that it is possible if you're going to try to design something that's doing what the internet is doing, which nobody has ever tried to do, then you could do a better job than this thing that accidentally escaped from the lab back in the 80s uh, because it was so great and that we're all using to do things that it really wasn't fundamentally designed to do. And that's not to detract from the immense achievements of the TCP AP architecture, which indeed the fact that it is doing all these things that it wasn't designed to do is absolutely miraculous and nobody has exceeded everybody's expectations. So, we will stimulate innovation not only in architecture research itself, but we presume in the layers above it, which is what we all really care about, by addressing three pain points of the current IP architecture that, again, I think you guys care about more than most. Trust and security. In a lot of ways, the IP architecture did not emphasize trust and security. Reducing complexity of managing the networks and of operating networks. Uh, and enhancing alignment with applications, how application designers have to think about what abstractions they have to develop to work with the network and to get the network to do things they want and to tell the networks things that they need. Uh, and uh, most importantly, and Van, this is really this particular flavor of ICN because now it's caught fire and Europe is in, doing its own projects and Japan is doing its own projects, other, other folks. But this particular flavor of I, uh, uh, ICN called NDN, named in networking, was really born out of an idea by Van Jacobson who was at PARC at the time and is now at Google. He's not working on this stuff at Google. He was supposed to be here today. He sends his apologies. But his primary uh, constraint, one of his primary constraints, was this thing has to be backward compatible with IP. Because nobody thinks we're going to have a flag day and start a new internet. We do think there is a possibility, and we're only going on looking at history, that you could evolve toward a new architecture the way IP evolved from the telephone network. Technically, IP was an overlay on the telephone system for about three or four decades. And now they're pulling out the telephone network underneath and everything's moving on to IP. So it, we have a precedent for this happening. It's not impossible. But in order for it to happen, we need to think about it as more of an overlay, like uh, um, IP, like IP over lease lines, and not like IPv6 <laughs> uh, or all the conversion technologies that have been attempted. So let's go, not 100 years, but let's go 40 years. The first packet over the ARPANET sent from UCLA back in 1969. Fundamentally same communication protocols 40 years later. 178 million views, uh, when I checked a couple nights ago, of user-generated content. Oh, this isn't quite users, but British Got Talent users. Uh, using a model like this, which again, data distribution, content-centric, not the optimal model for distributing content. You guys know about multicast. You might think, well, why don't you use multicast? We tried multicast in the 90s, ran into business model problems, trusting other people's infrastructure, OPN, OPI. So obviously, actually, as you guys probably know, this is not how YouTube operates today. YouTube now has relationships with most of the guys at the edge and puts caches in or data centers near the edge so that they're either appearing directly with the edge or, uh, or they are the edge. Um, now, YouTube can do that, but most people who are generating content, smaller guys, can't afford to do that. So the argument is that the IP architecture, because it, it, it requires this kind of relationships among larger guys in order to make content efficient work, content distribution work efficiently, uh, it's really the opposite of what many people thought of as the IP architecture being this democratizing force and it's peer-to-peer -peer and everybody can have an IP address as long as you get one before they run out. Uh, it's not how it has, it has not how the IP architecture, a fundamentally peer-to-peer -peer architecture, has worked in, embedded in the political economy that we have put it in, right? It has, it has worked out in a way that has actually promoted monopoly and consolidation. So not a great idea. Second big um, trend that's happening now, Internet of Things. When everything that is plugged into the wall is also attached to the Internet, then what? IP not really designed for that. NDN sort of, again, had this in mind when we, when we thought about, or when they, the folks who thought of it, thought about the architecture. And just to, to scare you appropriately, this is an IP, this is really what an IP packet looks like. Actually, this is a simplified model. I've seen pictures of IP packets in at ts network, I mean, schematics of what they look like in at ts network that have about 25 layers of foo in between to try to get all the management working in layers of MPLS. And uh, essentially, this is what happens when you put IP in the wild. It looks like a very simple stack, but when you embed it in the system where it has to work and make money for carriers, it's not so simple. And indeed, the Internet of Things ecosystem is developing all these new stacks, you know, lots of standards to choose from, as the saying goes. Um, and so really, 
you might look at this and say, wow, wouldn't it be nice if there was an architecture that really had, had Internet of Things in mind, had sort of s connecting up many, many devices, order six billion, without having to retrofit stacks that weren't designed for it. And then lastly, you have the middle. I alluded to this earlier. You have the cloud, uh, CDN's access providers. You have a communication ecosystem that really is dependent on a core. So that, for example, if you're in Japan and there's an earthquake in Tohoku and you have two cell phones that need to go to Tokyo to talk to each other, but the earthquake has severed the communication lines to Tokyo, you're not talking to somebody that's 50 yards away from you. And that seems like a weird way to design communication networks. So we would like to think about, again, if you were going to clean slate this whole thing, you would probably, and, I, and, I, and again, I want to emphasize, you can build IP networks without having central communication infrastructure. It's just not how it is convenient to do today. Uh, so we, the way that uh, the designers have thought of NDN is if you were going to if you were going to design a uh, architecture that would enable and promote ability to make local networks and indeed just not be able to take advantage of ad hoc networks and delay tolerant network, intermittent connectivity mobile devices um, and and we think and hope that this would also enable us to reach the other three billion as they say percent of the population that doesn't have access to this cloud infrastructure that we all use. And then there's other issues, energy consumption, privacy, vulnerability, that are a result of how IP is being used. So what can we do? Well, we can continue the status quo, where we keep doing patches, and this is your job, mostly, uh, and we keep seeing problems, and the complexity breeds more problems, or we can really go in a room and think, okay, what if we were gonna do this from scratch? Academics are lucky, they get a little bit of funding, at least to go off and do that, and actually quite a bit of funding has gone into this particular program. NSF has funded four different projects to think, uh, to think about future internet architectures. And again, Europe and, and Asia are funding their own. Uh, and several of them have gone, actually it was even more than four at the beginning. They've sort of winnowed it down. It was let a thousand flowers bloom and now it's let four flowers get some food, right? Um, uh, and each of the projects involves many universities. So this one is 10 universities. Uh, and so this particular project, and the rest of this talk I'll be focusing on NDN, is considering a new architecture based on lessons learned of how we use the current internet and pain points in particular about the current internet. New communication model, focused on data distribution as the general case. Uh, new security model, secure the data, not the channel, which turns out to be really hard to secure. And a new application development model, building on the security data blocks that we do. So just the, again, I think I probably don't need to drive this home, but if you're doing communication, uh, you, you, the naming cares about naming the endpoints. If you're doing channel-based communication, IP or telephony, you set up two endpoints, you name the endpoints, you set up a channel, you try to secure that channel and hope somebody doesn't break into the channel. Uh, memory really is not a notion. You have memory at the endpoints, but not in the, in the network when you have a channel-based model. And indeed, the security is about securing the process of setting up that channel. In a data distribution network, it's really quite the opposite. The naming is the content that you're moving. The naming is really, you want to name the content. That's what makes the most sense. The memory is potentially everything in the network could, be, could, in, could serve as memory. Uh, and the security is securing the data. So we are trying to rethink communication as a, all communication is potentially a special case of data distribution as the abstraction. What does that mean? Um, so the new communication model means that the network ships data. Uh, it ships bits that it knows are needed. I'll talk about the two kinds of packets that are in the Indian architecture right now. In the routers in the network, or indeed any device in the network, can do forwarding based on the names. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit mind melting, so I'll go, don't laugh when I say this, I'll go slow. <laughs> um, I said not to laugh, okay. Um, and then it's based, it's really fundamentally has a multicast velocity. You send traffic where you, uh, you send an interest for data wh wherever you can reach any interfaces that you have. So it it's, yields a kind of efficiency that a multicast network can reveal. Can, can yield. Uh, security. So it, IP architecture really has no fundamental security building block. We all know the drill, right? You can put in a fake source IP address. The name to IP mapping isn't secure unless you happen to be having DNS tech chain all the way to the top and that doesn't solve all the problems. And the routing is totally unsecure despite many decades of trying, right? So just naming, routing, and, and uh, addressing. That's all. We just didn't secure those things. The rest of it we can handle, right? No. So indeed, in an information center architecture, it's an easier problem. Well, I'm gonna have to convince you. Uh, but you secure the data. You at least don't need to worry about securing the channels. You secure the data, you secure the heck out of the data, and so that becomes what we call a open research problem, or <laughs> a good research problem. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, a lot at the end if I have time. 
So then sensitive content are encrypted if you want, uh, not encrypted fundamentally, but, but secure fundamentally by a signature. I'll get to that in a second. And then we have, and then also you might say naming, how are you going to route based on the names? Indeed, that is another research challenge. Tons of research challenges. As I said, this is not ready to deploy tomorrow, although there's lots of software available. I'm gonna talk, talk about it at the end. And then a new application development model that can hopefully take advantage of these cool new building blocks. That is, you can count on the network to do certain things you can't count on an IP network to do. Uh, and you can certainly count on, if you, if you have the right trust model abstraction, which is part of what we're doing, then you can kind of get security, a little bit of security in for free. Okay, so what's the stack look like? Everybody's seen the stack on the left. That's all our friend, TCP IP. And the end-to-end -end stack, as we view it, is on the right. Instead of IP, IP packets, IP header would really be how you think about the stack, you have uh, chunks of content, or a, again, the, the ident we'll talk about the types of packets you can have, but the, instead of the IP address being the unit of abstraction, the name of the content is the unit of abstraction. And then above, you have similar things. You have applications on the top, you have uh, phys physical conduit at the bottom. Indeed, one of the things that we learned about the IP architecture was it really got the hourglass model correct because the narrow waist promotes incredible innovation above and below it, but it gives you a, stabi a stable layer around which you can innovate. So we decided we needed to keep that. Uh, and another way to think about NDN, but it took me a long time to get my head around this, was that it's really just a generalization of the IP architecture. In the IP architecture, IP addresses name endpoints. In the NDN architecture, names can name anything, including endpoints. Uh, so what do the packets look like? There's two kinds of packets in NDN. This is a research project. I'm not gonna say there's be two kinds in five years, but right now there's two kinds. We're trying really hard to make there be two kinds. Interest in a piece of data, where you send out the name of the data that you're interested in, and content coming back, data packet coming back, which has that name of that, the name of the data that you asked for, the content itself that you asked for, some meta information that's the subject of much research discussions, and the signature. The signature is key. I hope to have 10 slides to talk about that. Every packet is signed. Now a whole bunch of questions are flying off in your heads, I hope, by now, and we'll get to some of them later. And then you even have a little schematic of how the communication works, but I'm gonna go a little bit further later, I think. Right, so let's contrast moving content around in an IP architecture and an NDN architecture. In an IP architecture, you got your source address, you get source and destination packet, it goes up to a router, it goes in the FIB, the FIB decides where it goes, it gets one choice, right? In the FIB, there's one forwarding path. I mean, you have other stuff down on the rib, but you get to use one. You send it, maybe you can't send it the other way because there's policy in there and business models and market mechanisms and things. Uh, and then it comes back, whichever way it can come back, hopefully it comes back. But the path is really determined by global routing, not local choice. And that's an important thing for people who think the IP is a romantic architecture that enables the end user to do whatever they want. In an information-centric architecture, this is not specific to NDN, uh, First of all, you can't get data unless somebody, you can't send data unless somebody's asked for it. So that made me really happy because I was getting a lot of spam the year that this started. Uh, you, you have to send an in interest in order to trigger data transition. The data flows over the reverse path. So there's some built-in level of congestion control there and that's a very complex topic that would be another talk to explain how does that always work? What if there's satellites and blah, blah, blah. But um, that's the, base, the baseline. And then all packets are signed. So you send out interest the router checks its own cache, maybe it has it, you get it immediately. If not, it broadcasts to every interface it has upstream, and then it can record performance of traffic coming back from each of its uh, upstreams to decide you know, which one might be better for, for traffic with similar names, like names with the same prefix. So you, you wanna think about names as hierarchically structured and the prefix similar to a BGP prefix, sort of today. So you turn something like that into something like that, right? Well, you might remember the Mbone, which tried to do something like this. Uh, and essentially, uh, that makes content distribution work a lot better, and a lot of people get confused when they hear ICN, they think, oh, that's like uh, Akamai, but inside the network. Uh, or that's just a network of caches. And it's really, and, and I can, uh, and I caution you because what I've just described might lead you there quickly, and I want you to, to know it's much bigger than that. Content distribution is one example of something that NDN makes easier but NDN is much bigger than content distribution. There are persistent problems with the internet, transport, routing, security, that we have not been able to solve in decades of trying, research trying, engineers trying, operators trying, standards organizations trying. And ICN efforts, NDN being one of them, has made some credible progress. It's still research. I'm not saying go plug your, make your laptops all do this instead of IP. 
yet, but I think these solutions can make a big difference. It's worth you guys keeping your eye on. And I'll give you an example. Again, how the abstractions, and they're not going to be completely unfamiliar abstractions to you. In fact, hopefully you'll say, yeah, maybe that would work at the network layer. Maybe there is something to that, or even as an overlay over IP for a certain pocket of communication models. So there's these three of the ones I just mentioned, transport, routing, security. I'm going to only talk about two. I'm going to talk about transport. I'm going to skip the middle one because it would really melt your brain. And I will um, talk about trust a little bit, transport. So how do we think about transport? These are vans. Some of these are van slides. I've borrowed slides. You send stuff from A to B. You mark what's been sent. You mark what's not been You know what's not been sent. And you use a sequence number to do that. Um, it models the process. Whoops, it went too far there. It models the process, not the outcome. What, how does NDN, and again, this is a very new, this is sort of bleeding edge of NDN, thinking about abstractions above the, above the sheer interest data two packets exchange, but how to do this at scale and how to support applications better. A better way is what's called synchronization. Well, okay, we, we talk about this in, in other contexts right now, data centers and databases. But again, borrowing from good ideas in neighboring sub-disciplines. We think of the interest data abstraction, the interest data pipe, uh, mechanisms as being able to support this notion of I send out an interest for a part of a database that I don't have yet or a part of a data structure that I don't have yet and I get a response, right? And so there's some theoretical results that have been published in the last 10 years, 15 years, I guess, that says the reconciliation of any two sets can be done with communication cost that's proportional to the difference between those sets. That's good if you can make it work in an implementation, if you could take advantage of these theoretical results. Uh, you can get something that's the same communication cost as TCP IP, but much more general and robust. So that's transport. And then let me talk about trust. And trust is really um, more difficult to get your head around. I will spend some time talking about it and then uh, it, hopefully entertain some questions. And by the way, if you're really lost or want me to slow down, raise your hand and you can ask a question. They said I'm allowed to take questions in the middle. Um, so a secure, we have a security researcher, Alex Halderman, who's worked on this project for just a couple of years, not since the beginning of it. He's really a host security guy, uh, historically, as many other things. He does a ton of things. And he came in kind of cold, learned about NDN, was a little skeptical, as a security person might be, saying, what, what is about the signatures? How do they work? How do you do this key distribution problem with the signatures? Um, but he gave a talk at our last PI meeting, and I stole some of his slides too, where he explained uh, the security concepts in NDN better than people who've been in the project for seven years. So let me try his way. Uh, NDN starts with some very simple mechanisms. And then there's a research process. We're in the process of, think of figuring out what sort of implications and applications these mechanisms can provide to us. Instead of, say, starting with security properties. Alex actually found this compelling because we don't get to define future threats, we get to define mechanisms, though. And indeed, the mechanisms have been quite generative of security capabilities, or at least promised security capabilities. So back to the interest data packet model. You've seen this bottom slide before, and the top slide modeling, actually you've seen this whole slide, and the top slide modeling um, how it works. Send out an interest, maybe it's in one of the caches along the way, maybe it goes all the way to the publisher. The publisher is the one that signs the content, so the, the publisher puts a, puts a signature in. And you've seen these, these things before, I'm reminding, I'm going pretty fast, but because of the lack of addresses, you actually are resistant to certain kinds of denial of service. Now, obviously, any new architecture will open up new potential for denial of service, like cache poisoning, you might have already thought of. Work is going on in that, too. Um, but you reduce the attack surface, not only because data flows only in response to an interest, so unsolicited traffic can happen. I spend a lot of my other part of my life studying, studying what you can learn from unsolicited traffic. But most importantly, all content must be signed. Right? So that gives you a very flexible foundation for not all content must be encrypted, repeat, privacy is sort of up to the user, but all content must be signed. Uh, the, the intermediate routers don't, could, but don't tend to, don't by default um, check the SIGs, but the endpoints do because the endpoints are who cares about the integrity of the content. So that's a flexible foundation for lots of security properties, integrity, authentication, access, all the things that you guys do. Now here's the sort of mind melding part is that a signature itself is a piece of content. So your, the first data packet has a, is a, has a signature in it, which is a key locator to a data packet that itself is a certificate. Certificates are named just like signed data. Indeed, you could argue you get them for free in this, in this data-centric approach, but you might say, okay, how, how do you get the, who's gonna do the certificate distribution part? How do you do key management? As, as he says, reducing it to, as I say, reducing it to a problem we already know we don't have, know, know how to solve. Um, 
Alex, well, I'll talk about that in a second. And so we've played a lot with format of signatures, uh, even developing mechanisms so that signatures can outlive the data that they sign, which indeed you might have to do sometimes, even if the signature is compromised. I'm not going to go into the details. There's lots of slides here. There's lots of slides online if you want to go into the nitty gritty. So, but the idea is if you had this working, and stay with me for a little bit, if you could get key distribution working. And so Al Alex is great because he's, I, I even I said to him, you seem quite confident uh, that the key distribution is a smaller problem, is, is not that big of a problem. It seems to me it's a huge problem, right? And he said, I do host security <laughs> for a living. So indeed, if I, can reduce a pro if I can reduce a problem to merely a key management problem, it does look easier to solve in the large. And of course, one could argue that if there were more motivation to make certain key distribution systems work better, uh, if there was more in return on investment of that, you might see more uptake and effectiveness. So that's an open question, I agree, including making signatures work fast, even if the routers don't have to do them. If every piece of content is signed, um, Signature efficiency is an important factor, but there's also been a lot of progress in the last several years. Uh, okay, so assuming all content is signed and that indeed content can leak to each other, the web, the web, a, a web of content, not necessarily the HTTP, but a, a name data network of content, provides a, a rich source of trustworthy information. Sort of the, the more things are connected and the more pieces of data you have, the harder it is for an attacker to violate the the trust. So security becomes an emergency, emergent property of the system. Uh, indeed, Alex Halderman's, one of his projects that was running in parallel was this thing called Let's Encrypt that some of you may have heard of, which is sort of automate trust certificate publishing. So he was indeed asking the right questions of us and he did, he, he's, the project sort of co-informed each other. Um, one, of the idea, one of the big ideas here will have to be how do you abstract trust, uh, automate, abstract identity verification, automate tr issuance of certificates. So I won't, will not lie to you and say that we have that part all figured out. Indeed, we have a test, we have an NDN test bed and we have sort of one guy who's in charge, he's our John Pastel, right? He's in charge of giving us certificates right now. Now, but the important, uh, a, a another important concept to take away of, uh, from the security dimension of NDN is, in order to make these signature things work for real people, you need what we now call some schemas that, that establish a framework of how signatures can, actually authorize who was allowed to see what, who was allowed to sign what. So a lot of the meat will come down to how is the namespace design, designed. That is, the namespace can be designed, and that's part of the point of it, it can be designed to enhance trust, to in, indeed guarantee trust by making sure the signatures themselves, have the, the names themselves are, are designed in a way to point to trust authority, to, point to trust authority and trust certificate. So here we have an example of a blog, a namespace design that can convey capabilities of who's allowed to sign a blog, oh, who's, al who's allowed to author a blog, who are the blog administrators, and the admin who gives the administrators administrative privileges. So we have developed, and there's a paper in the most recent ICN conference about examples of using what we call schematized trust, that is established models of this certificate is structured in this way, point to this role in a certain model of communication. Uh, and, it, and it works. At least it is now working for us in our test bed for routing, for signing routing authorities. So it's an abstract validation based on using the structure of the namespace to allow applications, and each, each application can pick their own trust schema. That's the good news. The bad news is each application can pick their own trust schema, right? No, an application can design their own trust schema or they can pick a well-established trust schema. So part of our job is going to be, can we create trust schemas, think of them as design patterns in programming, can we create trust schemas that are easy enough to use, accessible and powerful enough to serve a lot of different purposes? And that, again, people can use. But uh, what we've done so far, so says Alex the expert, and I'm not a security expert, but he believes it achieves vastly greater flexibility and security than existing TLS PKI. Okay, low bar <laughs> for the TLS PKI there, agreed. And then we're experimenting with uh, sort of challenging applications like OpenM Health, which makes us think, forces us to think about privacy and confidentiality at a fairly fine granularity. So we have one of our test apps, NDN Fit, like your fitness application on your phone that records data, but then we have had to use that app to think about, okay, I would like to share my running data with my friends, my personal data with a doctor. And so we've, we've used application-driven design specifically to force ourselves to think about really how is this gonna work in the real world where confidentiality and privacy are fine-grained notions. All right, so this is what I mentioned earlier, is that this, from a security perspective, we've, one of the things we've learned is that data-centric philosophy allows us to turn hard problems into relatively 
easier problems. And maybe you guys agree with that, and maybe you don't, and you can come talk to me after. Obviously, nobody's going to ever solve the security problem. You guys have jobs forever. But architecture can give us a more powerful foundation, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, who's using it now? Has anybody actually downloaded this? Wow, cool. OK, so you can tell me if I'm blowing smoke up here, right? Um, it's, not your, it's not ready for, for your dad, <laughs> probably, or your mom, or maybe even you. There are some big data applications. High energy physics community is, is starting to use this, and successfully, because these guys have big, huge chunks of data. And naming it, designing, if you have somebody who knows about namespaces to help you design the namespace of your data, can tremendously help you use that data in science, effectively share that data with CERN or whatever. Uh, compute on that data. Uh, there is a little bit of commercial interest in, in a narrow slice of it. Cisco is quite interested in this. They're interested in, in, again, productizing it in the shorter term, I think. So they're focused on how some of the concepts can be used to build, say, video content distribution layers, all reasonable. We had one, one guy, a single guy, I think runs a very small company who's using NDN as an overlay to provide secure, kind of like a secure Dropbox system. It's, uh, he's got slides up. He presented at the community meeting. We have NDN come every year. Oops, sorry. Uh, and there's a report on that. So if you want to learn really more about, but I, I will warn you, the focus right now is the big data science guys and some very uh, brave experimenters. However, and then there's a huge research agenda. Oh, I didn't know that was like that. Okay. Huge research agenda. So I think this is a very, you know, and one of the things we've learned is you, you, you know you pick a good problem when there's way more papers to write than you can possibly write or way more things to look at and, and, build, tools for and build tools for than you can possibly do in the amount of money that the funding agency has given you. And that's indeed what happened to us. So the research agenda is broad and wide and deep and exciting. Uh, and um, I'll just go into the code that's available now in case people want to play with it and then take some questions. So highly collaborative, 10 campuses involved. Software is all open source, GitHub. Uh, lot, everything, almost everything we do that we can put online, we put online. Tutorials, tech reports. I'll give you an example of a tutorial we put online. So there's an annual conference now called ICN, Information Centric Networking Conference. And we had four papers there. Uh, last month, and all that stuff is online. I don't think the videos are online. Our website is name-data.net. Why should you care? Maybe you're convinced already, but I think operators have a particular appreciation for looking at problems in new ways that can get rid of unnecessary detail. And we're moving into a world where lots of complexity is going to be added to IP, like even more than is added now, in order to make it work for domains in which it was not designed to work in. So we are trying to rethink it, knowing where the puck is going and trying to skate in that direction. Um, all right, so nuts and bolts, nuts, Nendian nuts and bolts. Here's what the architecture looks like right now. From a code perspective, we've got this base called an Nendian forwarding daemon. That's where the magic happens as interest and data, interest get forwarded and data gets sent back. And then you have things that establish tunnels for overlays and libraries, applications, routing information. And this is this box in the middle, NFD box, is blown up here. Lots of stuff going on inside the NFD architecture and lots of documentation. This is one of the better documented parts of the project, 50 page sort of manual on N how NFD works, because you do have, you know, the equivalent of the spiritual equivalent of uh, BGP routing policy would be forwarding strategies inside, inside an NDN node where you would get to sort of use meta information that you may get to determine where to send interest if you don't want to send them across all interfaces that we call faces in NDN. Uh, and there's lots of libraries, multiple languages are being supported in libraries, really trying to make it an eco a software ecosystem that people will really experiment with, because We've learned, if there's one thing we've learned, and we kind of went in thinking this, so this hypothesis has been dramatically confirmed, that application-driven design is the most effective way to find faults with your assumptions about architecture. So lots of applications. Again, I'm, Facebook isn't on here yet, but you know, we're, we're working. There's a chat, there's a chat uh, application. There's an NDN video application. We're really looking for users to come and try to break it for us and tell us what's wrong with it. So if you are so inclined, and I'd love for the people who have used it to come up and give comments, uh, GitHub slash name data. Named dash data. Uh, and then there's a tutor tutorial that's only a couple weeks old where we really focused on one thread of it, the security and synchronization aspect. Um, and we're hoping to get more people interested, guiding uh, research and development, and just people like you who, who may not be doing research but are interested in nuts and bolts and plumbing and how people are thinking about it. And you, you are the most important people who can tell us where our assumptions are wrong about how, how people operate and manage networks. So um, that tutorial is online there on our, on our website. And so second to last slide um, is this overarching vision for the future internet. So what have, I, what have I basically told you? That we believe a future internet will probably have, and again, taking lessons from not only the history of networking architecture, but the history of communication 
moving, moving data around inside companies, inside data centers. We believe that the vision of the future will include secure, immutable data with hierarchical names, most names being hierarchical. This will support the architecture's design to be aligned with the needs of big science as well as small IoT needs, mobility, intermittency, and connectivity, and promotion of data efficient data management and sharing. Uh, in this model, applications can focus on their data and the networking, much of the networking plumbing, they don't have to worry about like they have to worry about with IP. That's the hope, that's the vision. And we also believe this, the model that includes in-network storage, which of course has a whole bunch of economic implications and how people are gonna work out putting content in their routers and charging for that as the, as the ecosystem does today. But uh, the ability to use in-network and storage and multicast can help mitigate traffic growth, uh, eliminate the heavy reliance on the cloud when you may not when you may not be having, having access to it and enable the rest of the world who doesn't have the kind of infrastructure that we have here to uh, take advantage of networking in a better way. All right, where is NDN on the, not the hype curve, but the, this is the, what they call the, um, I forget, the two hump with the valley of death in the middle when you get, try to get research through to tech transfer, as they call it in the Fed land, uh, to commercialization and monetization. And Dave Clark wrote this great blog entry that you have to go look at this, not blog, they weren't blogs back in 85, it was an essay on the website. <laughs> Um, to describe uh, sort of how researchers try to fit their project kind of before that line. Uh, because really, I, I think ND, at least NDN, and you should know there's a working group in the IRTF, R is for research, so before it's ready for the IETF, there's a working group in the IRTF that's called ICN, ICNRG, ICN Research Group, that is trying to sort of distill some of the uh, different ideas that different pockets of people have with respect to what an ICN-based architecture should look like and pushing toward standardization, we are really still focused on the research. So we really think ICN is kind of right here uh, on the development trajectory. So as he said, this is a forward-looking talk to just give you a sense of, of what we're thinking about. And I think that's it. So now I am happy to take questions. I finished sooner than I thought. Yay. It was a lot. Do you want me to repeat anything? <laughs> Especially the people who have used it, please come to the mic and. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't want to go into too much of the details. So Pitt is, um, and that was, I didn't, did I actually say those? Fib. Well, Fib, um, yeah, it was, oh, it was Twin Dan? Um, No, there was no diagram at the end. Oh, yes, yes, right. So I'll tell you the I'll tell you the nitty gritty details. Ta the t these are like routing tables. The equivalent, again, spiritual equivalent of routing tables in IP. Fib indeed is like Fib in BGP, forwarding information base. PIT is pending interest table. So you might figure you've got a okay. The, how does the how does the world work in in, in the end? You send interest out if you want a piece of data. There's interest. The the router keeps the interest. The node keeps the interest. Uh, and then sends it on if it doesn't have it in its content, CS is content store. Sorry, I should have introduced some of these terms. If it doesn't have it in its, in its cache, in its content store, then it sends the interest on and, there, and thereby it know, when, the, when the content comes back, it knows who it was for. So the PIT is pending interest table. Yep. Hey, um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to limit it as- Okay, I probably won't uh, be able to answer most of them, but- Yeah. Um, so are you still gonna be you know, depend on BGP, or is that going to be? Uh, <laughs> could or yes and yes and no. That is, you know, I, right now we have an NDN test bed, and the end, I should have drawn a map of it. The NDN test bed is global, but it's an it's an overlay on IP. In a pure NDN world, not necessarily, right? In fact, so that was the 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 line that I wasn't going to describe, which was the routing. But you know, really, in a world where you have names. Like BGP, you could use BGP, you could use, actually, the test right now use name, uh, NLSR, which is essentially um, uh, link state routing for the, for the test bed, but it's essentially a hack to BGP to enable it to work with names, okay. right? In the, in the future, there's lots of way crazy routing type ideas, which are actually very compelling ideas. Ideas that, again, in the last 40 years of routing, theoretical routing research, tremendous results have happened that the internet has not been able to take advantage of. So in some ways, the, the routing stack is a bit ossified, the term they've used for a while in, the, in the, some communities. Um, obviously, lots of vibrancy and tweaks and features to BGP, but fundamentally, the, the idea is the same. So there is a routing idea floating around that we're experimenting with in NDN called hyperbolic greedy forwarding. And the idea of this, have you heard of this? No, not yet. So the idea of this routing, and it's, it's a very, uh, 
it's again aligned with the way that the architecture works is that there's no routing table per se. There's uh, a notion of routing, uh, you're, you're routing based on names, and then you're routing based on the structure, you're leveraging the structure of the namespace to decide where to send the, the interest or the, where to send the packet. But, it, but in, this, in this model right now, interests are being broadcast to the, every interface. Um, last question. Uh, so there, and there's a great paper on hyperbolic routing. I think it's in ICN, but there's a, there's a paper on routing in NDN that you can find on the name data website that's really worth reading. Okay. okay. So assuming everything's going to work just fine, right? Uh, You're more optimistic than me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm getting to the pessimistic part. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of problems, as you highlighted today, with the way internet or IP works today, right? Yes. Uh, some of them, as you said, uh, YouTube can become an edge itself. It has enough money. Uh, the ISPs, that's why you have a net neutrality issue and you know all of those things. Uh, how would you prevent NDN from getting that space? Because essentially, if you look at it, namespace replaces, uh, replace IPs and people can start hoarding namespaces. How, right. you know, we had problems with IPs and people start buying too many, uh, too many ranges. And, you right. know, so how would you prevent NDN going down the same route? You, right, well, we, n nobody knows what will happen to an architecture when it's thrown over the fence into the wild. Right? And indeed, there were a lot of things we didn't anticipate about the IP architecture being thrown over the fence as well. But the IP architecture wasn't really being designed for that anyway. At least we are going into it, lo looking at what happened to the IP architecture, what is happening to the IP architecture, and thinking about are there ways, are there points we can put into the architecture that would make it harder to do that, or at least make it easier for, indeed, small people to set up their own networks. Right? The, the Internet of Things world, where you're not dependent on the large company to have access to the core. So I think that, let's, let's, talk about the difference between um, IP addresses. Right now, you get IP addresses from typically your provider. Mm -hmm. So that already is the wrong approach, right? Mm -hmm. If it were the case that you really just ne need to get na names, like your DNS names, which, okay, that's another pile of policy and politics and problems, yeah. um, you wouldn't, at least you wouldn't be dependent on communication for getting IP addresses, right? You would say, send an interest for a name of your friend that has data somewhere up the stream, and if he's locally, and if there's a, co uh, the, the idea of setting up cooperative networks locally becomes very easy with NDN, when you're not dependent on getting IP addresses, infrastructure IP addresses from your provider. Now, again, you should say to me, well, look, anybody can use Net10 to send up their, set up their own network, and it's, it's just that, again, yes, you can set up Net10, but that doesn't take care of the content layer for you. So there is a lot more available to you in an NDN world as a local person trying to set up a pocket of, of connectivity, a pocket of communication that you, that you aren't reliant on infrastructure than there is in at least the current IP world and the way that people share content in the current IP world. I totally take your point that you, know, you, you should think about all the things that could happen that are very hard to or predict. Uh, and indeed, NSF has thought about this or, and people have commented to them on this. The National mm -hmm. Science Foundation, who's funded this work for the last seven years, um, has had a special um, side group called Values and Design, where they try to have people come and think about the politics, the economics, the privacy, all of the issues that maybe network researchers tend not to think about. Like especially and they, the signatures, right? Like they will start becoming important as well, and right. you, know, you don't want people to abuse that. Abuse it, meaning what, break? I mean, if you're gonna have uh, somebody who signs a signing authority, right? Right. Then, again, you're, you're creating another potential place for commoditizing this. For commodity? Sorry. Yeah, uh, That's okay. Yeah, ask me after. But yes, I agree. The, I mean, the signature and the key management problem is a huge, is a huge open problem. We're trying to came, create mechanisms that will make it easier to solve. Is, is it too late? Oh, okay. Sorry, one question. I'll talk as fast as I can, Mario. Uh, so when I looked at NDN a year ago, it seems like the, one of the things that was really tricky is figuring out how you would model a, um, an application with mutable state, right? So it's really clear how you could build the namespace for uh, um, static, uh, immutable data or, or constantly uh, growing immutable data. Yes. But it was very unclear to me how you, um, how you could define uh, applications with mutable state. And so I'm wondering what kind of progress has happened in the last year uh, in that space and if you've come up with ways to sort of schematize that in the same way that you were talking about. Yes, it is, it is a topic of research conversation. It would take too long, I think, to answer, but let me talk to you offline about okay. it. But yes, we, it is an active area of research and consideration. Oh, well, really. Thank you very much.